bike. Now today we Right, so what we have here, as any fans of air crash investigation programs will know, is a flight data recorder used to figure out what went wrong when uh, planes crash. So let's just take a quick let's just take a quick look around the outside. Um, on the back here, there's a couple of connector ports, only one of which is actually used. I'm guessing this sort of, this whole thing plugs into a rack, and these make contact when the thing gets plugged in. Um, there's obviously options for different things, perhaps they use one, one socket for the copic voice rep recorder and the other for flight data recorder, or maybe there's just options for recording other parameters or, so, or something, I don't know. And this end we've got um, this big round connector here, I'm guessing that's possibly to plug in um, test equipment or something to retrieve the data while it's still in the aircraft. They're pretty useful for monitoring, also for testing recorder as well as sort of post-incident um, recording. There's a lead on the front marked bite, I'm guessing that means probably some like built-in test equipment, so that would be some sort of self-test indicator. This um, this is an underwater location beacon, basically it's, um, it issues a, a 37 kilohertz a chirp once a second or so. Um, so this is when when the aircraft goes down in water, the water activates this thing, so it helps them find it. This ultrasonic uh, beat that they can uh, then uh, try and locate it. This is actually activated by water. There's uh, a contact on the side. This you see is a plastic outer, which I'm guessing is Teflon in the centre and an outer electrode. We'll take a look inside that in a minute. And there's these two ports here. Um, let's cover off. Um, they, these are connected to these two pressure sensors and if you look one of these both ports go to one sensor and uh, the other sensor seems to only have a single port so I'm guessing there's a pitot tube for airspeed sensing and a single sensor for altitude sort of barometric pressure sensing so that in addition to the information it gets from the aircraft this has probably got its own independent sensing system for that you know the airspeed and the altitude are probably the most important thing so this probably provides an additional self-contained sensing of those parameters for recording, just to be absolutely sure it gets those uh, gets that information. Now this is the underwater location beacon. That screws on by these uh, mounting brackets. At the end, you've got um, these two electrodes. This plastic sort of feels like Teflon. It says sort of keep clean. Um, in addition to detecting when the thing goes into water, this is also used for checking the battery condition. Um, you just measure the voltage across these points and the, um, the documentation says at what voltage it should be sort of uh, replaced. That's sort of 3.16, so that's still fairly good. Um, this does actually have an expiry date on April uh, 2005. Now there is a version of this with a replaceable battery. Uh, this isn't um, one of those, so uh, it might take a little bit of effort to take it apart. So let's, let's just give it a test before we uh, put it to pieces. Let's just drop it into the water. Now I can just hear a very, very slight, slight click from that. I'll put the microphone really close just to see if it will come out. I'm not sure if it will. And it's just the, the very, very slightest of clicks. But um, here I've got this uh, an ultrasonic transducer, so we'll, so we'll just stick that in the water and see if we can uh, measure what this thing's putting out. And we can clearly see the uh, ultrasonic bursts being received. So according to the data sheet it's 37 kilohertz. And yeah, 37, 37 kilohertz. And it will chirp about 10 milliseconds long. And it's happening about almost exactly once every second. Um, according to the information I found on this, the battery is designed to last for about a month underwater. 
and obviously this thing has to work potentially at quite deep quite sort of deep sea depth so it's probably designed to withstand a fair amount of pressure um, and also probably work at fairly low temperatures so um, see if we can get it apart and uh, have a look what's inside it this thing looks like it might unscrew does seem to be opening Yes. Well, that came apart surprisingly easy, easily. Obviously there's a ceiling o-ring here. I'm a little bit surprised they didn't just pop the whole thing actually. There's some sort of substance in there. I don't know if that's a filler or whether there might be... No, I think that's just some sort of filler. I don't need any electronics in there. And we have a battery that seems to have the manufacturer's name taken off. Down here there's this spring for the other battery contact. Just some rubber insulation there. Sticker inside. And I've got a nasty feeling this bottom area might be potted. So I'm guessing maybe the version of this with the replaceable battery, the only difference is they there's a cap that's removable. As opposed to this one, it just hasn't got anything to grab hold of it easily with. Yeah, this other end does unscrew. It, it took some getting off. Um, I had to fire a couple of flats on the edge to get enough grip on it. So that's just the plastic with the uh, electrode on it. And we have a PCB underneath some... Uh, the potting compound or conformal coating. Right, after a bit of uh, gentle persuasion with a hammer I managed to basically force this assembly out through the front. Um, so what we've got here, this is a ring shaped piezo transducer. So this is actually using the uh, generating sort of an outward force on the casing to couple the uh, sound into the water and then this this is just the shape of the potting compound. I think this PCB probably went in there and there's some holes in here so the potting compound was probably just sort of squirted into the uh, into the holes. There's another little hole, drain hole at the bottom so this is just the potted assembly. I'm not sure if we can actually get anywhere with this but I'll have a go. Well, there's actually a little adjustment screw in here. There's, um, I think there's a piece of ferrite on it. So I think this is at the top of here. There's probably um, a little ferrite pot core or uh, transformer <coughs> to produce the high voltage drive for the transducer. And this would probably be to fine tune it. So I think it's that little, I think that little sleeve is ferrite. So that goes in and out of the coil to fine adjust the tuning. And there's what looks like a crystal or possibly a sort of tuning fork type crystal, um, maybe for the 37 kilohertz ultrasonic frequency. Um, I'm guessing it might be similar to the sort of 32k watch crystal type thing. Looks like some sort of vaguely sort of tuning fork structure in there. Right, I've dug this partly apart, I really can't be bothered um, taking all the compound off. There's a chip under there. Not SP143D, I can't find any information about. There's a couple of transistors here, and this is the output transformer. So, this is these will be the drivers for the uh, transformer to produce a high voltage output to drive the transducer. Um, nothing particularly interesting or exciting. All it does is go beep ultrasonically once a second, so I don't think it's worth the effort of uh, digging any deeper into that. Right, let's uh, get this thing open.
Right, so obviously this is the fireproof um, area where the actual tape's stored. Got a load of uh, old school TO3 power transistors and voltage regulators here. Most of these are regulators, a couple of transistors, LM117, 7812s, LM123s for voltage regulators. And a little cage full of PCBs down here. And even a warranty seal. I'm pretty sure somebody's been inside this before me. Let's just take a look at these uh, PCBs. Right, so in the back here you can see a um, a power input filter. This thing runs on 115 volts, 400 hertz, which is a pretty standard aircraft power supply. Um, this first board looks like it's got a power supply orientated. There's um, some transformers here. It says 115 volts, 400 hertz to uh, 26 volts. Obviously, because it's 400 hertz, the core size of the transformer is quite a lot smaller than um, corresponding 50 hertz or 60 hertz transformer would be. Um, that looks like there's another one there, maybe another one there to produce different um, supply voltages. Um, voltage regulator, some relays here, a little piggyback board. Uh, it says MMI, that's probably a, a program or logic device. MMI were monolithic memories who were one of the first companies to produce programmable logic. These boards are very uh, heavily conformal coated. Uh, there's quite a lot of bodge wires on here. And obviously all the chips are sort of military type sort of ceramic packages. Again there's another sort of piggyback board here with a few bits and pieces on it. Can't see anything particularly obvious or exciting but that looks like uh, mostly power supply. And I'm guessing that's an HD converter AD571S, a big ceramic side braze package. Um, 74, sorry 54LS military grade logic chips um, I think there's a sample and hold LF198 uh, sample of hold amplifiers some other various sort of analog looking stuff and these look like sort of some sort of option links multi-layer board I think that's probably about six layers on that board and this is obviously the main seat processor board there's a um, looks like an 8080 microprocessor chip, some various uh, 54LS, that's probably the clock oscillator there, crystal, various sort of peripheral, peripheral devices. A little detail on this chip, that actually um, obscured the part number on here. Um, I think the reason for that is this is an AT2S191 which is a 2K bipolar PROM. So they obviously wanted to replace the generic part number with their specific part number, which is yeah, the, basically the programmed part with their code in it. So it's nothing to do with these silly sort of people that scratch numbers off. It's purely to avoid any confusion so that someone doing servicing didn't just pick a 82S191 off the shelf and stick it in. It has to be the right, actually have the right code to actually have the right um, programming in it. Programming in it, but there's only, only 2K of code in this one, so there's not a great deal... Um, being done by this. And another board, this has got another 8080 on it. Um, EEPROM there with some software in it. And this is a, a 2732, which is only 4K, so again, not a huge amount of software in there. I've tried reading this, there's no obvious text or any interesting messages in there. And in fact, even that EEPROM's only like half full. It's only got uh, two cav code in it, so obviously the software in this thing is extremely simple. Not doing very much at all. Again, old school 54LS logic on it. MS138, that's probably an address decoder. Again, seems to be a few layers on this PCB. And just some more sort of logic. Latches, there's a lot of 374s, maybe that's some IO expansion or something. Again, a little bit of analog stuff, but mostly 
LS, LS CTL, a few other analog bits and pieces there. Right, this looks like the major part of the power supply. This was screwed in to the sides to actually help for mechanical support, probably to help heat conduct heat to the outer casing. Um, that I'm guessing is the main, main sort of trial transformer for the power. There's these capacitors now. I'm guessing these might be um, tans large tantalum cap rather than electrolytics because of the uh, the temperature range these things work on. That's not uncommon on um, military and high spec stuff. Not sure if they're solid or they might be liquid tantalum or something. Uh, a little bit exotic, but obviously they're quite sort of they're, they're hermetically sealed at the end. Interesting, they seem to have four terminals. And if that's because there's either two capacitors in each can or just for mechanical support, they just put one lead at each end to hold them down. Inside this assembly, nothing exciting. Some bridge rectifiers, so this is clearly a toroidal main transform with multiple um, windings on it. Probably some voltage regulators here in the uh, smoothing caps, all pretty uh, straightforward. Oh, one thing that's a little bit surprising, this is the actual motor that drives the tape and it's actually outside the fire enclosure. Um, there's actually some rubber drive belt that, that goes through into the, the tape area, through these rollers. Um, I suppose one reason is just to minimise the volume that's inside the protected area. Um, just to provide something, give it the maximum thickness of um, fire protection. So you probably want to make it as small as possible, just to give you the maximum thickness of protective material. So maybe that's what yeah, it makes sense to put the motor outside, because obviously it doesn't need to be in there from the point of view of recovering the data afterwards. Um, there's these sort of connectors or sort of deconnectors. Um, these are the shielded wires, so this will be to the record and uh, the record heads. And there's a few other wires going down to this connector onto the main board. Another little detail, the, um, the protected enclosure is mounted on these rubber, soft rubber shockproof mounts. Obviously this thing potentially has to withstand a quite substantial impact. Alright, so this is the important bit. The, the tape drive, the, the, um, the motor, it actually just looks like a stepper motor, it says 7.5 degree stepper motor. This whole thing is the cover, I mean that's probably about an inch and a half, maybe almost two inches thick. I'm guessing there's maybe different materials in here for to provide sort of the fire resistance. There's sort of an outer metal, sort of looks like a stainless steel machined outer. There's some, I don't know if that's actually heat resistant paint or something on the outside and there's some stuff on the inside. Right, so this is the inside of the tape unit. Um, the tape is missing out of this one, unfortunately. Um, you can see there's four heads here. These are multi-track multi heads. There'll be some permutation of record and playback. I'm guessing these are probably arranged so that they're interleaved, so that one head records alternate tracks and the other one records the ones in between, just to avoid the heads having to be too dense. There's a couple of optical sensors, one here and one here, so these will be to detect holes in the tape, very similar to the old um, large computer tape format cartridges. Um, the actual drive comes onto this pulley. Now, I, th I suspect that this pulley here is missing this outer aluminium rim. Um, there's a couple of pulleys back here, so I think the way this probably runs is sort of like that. And then that one will go around that pulley, around this one, I think. So the the belt would actually drive the outside surface of the tape, and the tape would go sort of around that, around this guide, through there, sort of through here, across the heads, up here, and then down again to tension it across the heads, up here, through there, and then back onto this reel. Um, this looks like it's sort of reel to reel. It'll start at one point, record, and then rewind itself. I've had a look, quick look through the patent um, 
spec number on the uh, the outside of this and it does refer to sort of fast forward you know, rewind type operations I have seen other um, flight recorders uh, on a TV program where it used like a single pancake of tape where it pulls the tape out of the center and then winds it back onto the outside um, rather like the old 8-track tape cartridges but this seems to be a sort of simple reel true it looks like it's you know, very similar in structure to the old like DC 600 type um, computer tapes Obviously, all you know, nice old ball bearings everywhere. Very solid, little solid base. This base plate, there's not really anything behind it. Again, this is really solid mounting plate. But what we've got under here, there's the the um, the belt that comes in from the external motor, and the rest of this is just joint, just connection. So all the wires from the heads and everything go to this this bit of sort of turret tag board, and then the wires out, out, outside just connect back off that. So there's not really anything else. In there, this just mounts to the other side of this shell, which again is like a good inch and a half thick of uh, various kinds of insulating material to protect the tape because obviously tape's quite heat sensitive. If you take it apart from the just the general issue of plastic melting, um, if you take it above a certain temperature, it loses its magnetism. So I don't know what the actual rating of this is, but I'm sure it's designed to withstand you know high temperature fire for a good you know, a good deal of time to preserve the data. Um, there's this sort of felt stuff, this is like a sort of soft felty material on here which I assume is just to stop the tape sort of going anywhere, sort of guide the edge of it, I can't really see much in the way of any, there's a sort of slight ring shape which probably corresponds to the outside of the roll here on there but can't really see any other obvious markings showing sort of where the tape path went or anything on there. I'll just take a close look at this pressure sensor board. There's um, some electronics here. There's a ref01 voltage reference. Um, can't quite see the numbers. I'm guessing these will be op amps. There's some uh, precision foil resistors here. I'll take them on the sensors apart. Um, this is like a hybrid module. There'll be some uh, laser trim resistors here for calibration. These pressure sensors, I'm guessing this is a, like a silicon bridge type pressure sensor, which is the normal type there quite sensitive to temperature and there's quite a lot of parts part variation so they need quite a lot of calibration. Actually, I'm not quite sure there's a separate set of wires going in here. I don't know if maybe that's a temperature sensor or something. I don't understand why they'd take wires in there rather than to the main hybrid so maybe it's just some additional sensing. Um, this whole top is potted so I don't think there's really anything I can do to get any further into that. So, um, moderately interesting bit of tech, no, no real surprises there, you know, basically it's just a very ruggedized uh, tape drive, but um, just quite a cool thing to see the insides of. And obviously, yeah, this thing isn't but, yeah, particularly useful for anything, although I do actually have a use for it. There you go, nice doorstop. So I was thinking the other day, if you're the company that manufactures these flight recorders, um, obviously you're going to ship them out, you're probably going to air freight them out. Just imagine if an air freight uh, plane full of flight recorders crashed. Wouldn't that confuse the hell out of the investigators?